Hi, I'm Dan and I work at Fanatic Bike. We're known for helping people create gorgeous custom builds with some of the best mountain bike brands on the planet. We've separated all the parts of a mountain bike into six different systems, which we're gonna break down in this series. With a good understanding of how all these components come together, you'll be able to confidently configure your own dream build. So stay tuned and join us in understanding mountain bikes. Now, looks aren't everything, but of all the components that make a mountain bike look so cool, I think the brakes are right up there with the front fork. A big, powerful looking rotor mounted up to your wheel makes your bike look like it can take on the world. And with how good brakes are these days, you pretty much can. In today's episode of Understanding Mountain Bikes, we'll demystify hydraulic braking systems and show you that they're a lot simpler than you might think they are. We'll also look at how rotor size affects braking performance and talk about some of the most commonly found adjustments on today's mountain bike brakes. To start, I'll note that all modern mountain bike brakes are hydraulically actuated. That means that they use a specially designed fluid to convert force that you exert on your lever up here on your handlebar to braking power down here at the rotor and at the wheel. Let's quickly run through all the parts of today's brakes, starting up here on the handlebar. This whole unit up here is called the lever assembly. Now here we have the lever blade, which is designed with this flat pot part in the center so that if you crash and whack this against a tree, it'll be likely to bend here and you can easily bend it back. If you can't or if it does break off, you can easily replace this whole piece. That's attached to the lever body, which houses a piston inside here that pushes fluid through this hose down to your caliper. Inside your caliper, you have your brake pads. These are in front of the pistons, which are those white circles back there, which push the pads against your rotor. Now, to understand how all these components work together, I do want to cover a bit of basic physics to understand the hydraulic component of these brakes. Let's pretend that my fingertips here are molecules in this case in a fluid, any fluid, it doesn't matter. Molecules in a fluid are close enough together that you can't squeeze them any closer. However, when you add heat to that, they'll eventually move far enough apart that they turn into a gas. Molecules in a gas have enough space in between them that you can compress them, say for example in your tires or in your rear shock. An example of that that you see every day is when you boil water. Those bubbles that you see in the bottom of a pot of boiling water aren't actually air bubbles, they're gaseous water. That heat turns the water into a gas. So how does this apply to mountain bike brakes? Well, when your brakes are set up properly, the only thing inside this system is an incompressible fluid. When you push this lever up here at the bar, that piston I mentioned forces that fluid through this hose down to the caliper and it forces those pistons out to squeeze on your rotor. This lever is designed to give your finger a mechanical advantage and essentially multiply the power that your finger could normally just apply to a set of pads and rotors. What happens if air gets into this system though? Well, like I said, air can be compressed. So now when I squeeze this lever, the piston will push on a little air bubble, squeeze it into a smaller air bubble, and your brakes won't function properly. The pistons won't push as hard against that rotor. That little bit of physics I mentioned is also the reason that we use a special fluid. Brakes generate a lot of heat, and if our fluid turned into a gas when we needed it most, that piston would then be pressing on those gaseous bubbles of this fluid instead of doing anything to help us slow down. From time to time, air does wiggle its way inside these systems though, and that's when it's time to bleed your brakes. The procedure to do this varies from brake manufacturer to brake manufacturer a little bit, but it essentially entails pushing new fluid through the system so that air bubbles are flushed out. If that's a project you wanna take on, most manufacturers have instructional videos or written instructions on how to do that, and we sell most of the tools you might need for all the brake brands out there. At the beginning of this episode, I mentioned big, shiny, cool looking rotors. You've probably noticed that different bikes have different size rotors or even that your bike might have a different size front and rear rotor. Why is that? 
Well, larger rotors have more stopping power because they offer your caliper more leverage to stop the wheel. It's just a longer moment arm to grab onto. Typically, large rotors like this 200 mil rotor I have here have been the domain of downhill bikes and more recently enduro bikes. As bike geometry has progressed, they've also trickled down into bikes with less travel that are able to now go faster. People typically run two of the same size rotor or possibly a larger one on the front wheel. That's because your front wheel actually does most of the braking when you're using both your brakes at once. The, front, the action of the rear wheel pushes your front wheel down onto the ground, giving it more traction. If you have trouble picturing this, go outside, hop on your bike, and do a wheelie. While you're wheeling, grab your, wheel, your rear brake, and you'll see that it'll push your bike, it'll pivot around the rear wheel, and push your front wheel into the ground. Now, how do you decide which size rotor you need? Well, firstly, frames and forks do typically have minimum and sometimes maximum rotor sizes. The minimum is determined by the height of these posts here, which will space your caliper away from the frame or the fork and determine a minimum size rotor you can run. Frames typically also have a maximum size rotor, wherein the rotor will eventually get big enough that it'll contact the chain stay here. Forks typically don't have that issue because the rotor isn't going to impede on any part of the fork itself. Now, once you've determined that, which is always on the manufacturer's website, I typically recommend that people start with the smallest size rotor they can get away with, simply because it weighs less and it's just a smaller thing to whack, accidentally whack on something. Usually for people 150 pounds or lighter, you can get away with a 160 mil rotor on the back and maybe if you want a 180 mil rotor on the front. If you're 150 pounds or more, especially if you're trying to push your speeds and charge really hard, typically most people will run 180 mil rotors or 180 and a 200 on the front. Sometimes these days, even two 200 millimeter rotors. It's all about sort of experimenting and seeing what you can get away with. To accommodate a different size rotor, you will need to determine what size adapter you need. An adapter, as we can see here, is simply a spacer that moves your caliper further away from the center of the rotor. They typically come in 20 millimeter increments. So for example, the Fox 36 comes naturally at 180 mils. So to run a 200 mil rotor, we need this 20 millimeter adapter. Let's quickly cover some of the most common adjustments we'll find on today's hydraulic disc brakes. The first of these is called reach on SRAM brakes. That's what the R in code RSC stands for, or guide R's for example. On our Shimano SLX brakes we have here, you can see it, it's this knob, which is typically how it's done on most brakes. What that means is how far you have to reach to reach the lever. So riders with smaller hands, will move the reach in so the lever is closer to the bar so they don't have to reach as far. Riders with larger hands will move it further away for a longer reach. The second adjustment I want to touch on is called contact adjust on SRAM brakes, denoted by the C in RSC. It's called free stroke on Shimano brakes and it doesn't have it on the SLX brakes that are demonstration site had, so I swapped this out here with my own following. Uh, it's called bite point adjust on hope brakes and dead stroke adjust on haze brakes. All these different names do the same thing and it adjusts how far away or how much your lever blade travels before the contact point is arrived. So for example, with SRAM, think about moving the contact point in towards the handlebar. You can see this arrow directing us towards in. So if I turn that, the lever will now engage closer to the bar or out away from the handlebar. And now it engages further away from the handlebar. The last important point worth mentioning about hydraulic disc brakes is the pad compounds. Now we actually have a pretty good video describing the different pad compounds, which I'll link to 
up there and at the end of the video. It primarily covers one of our new favorite brands called MTX Braking. They make ceramic compound braking pads, but typically you'll find metallic compounds and organic compounds. Depending on where you are and how you like to ride, your choice might differ, so do check that video out. With this video today though, I hope you'll understand all the parts of a mountain bike disc brake, as well as even some of the physics behind them. This hopefully will enable you to feel comfortable in learning how to even bleed your brakes if you want to learn how. Now, you'll also know how to set up your brakes, the adjustments on them, and even possibly select a different size rotor if the one you have isn't right for you. If you have any questions about any of the stuff, please do leave us a comment below. We're happy to answer them for you. You can also shoot us an email at sales at fanaticbike.com or give us a phone call at one 844 fanatic If you like these videos, please like it, click like, and do subscribe to our channel. It really helps us making them. We really like telling you all about what's cool in the world of mountain biking. Stay tuned for our next video, and we'll see you then.